I'm going to be talking about uh, the effects of microplastic on life in oceans. And the first slide I'm going to put up is just to, it's a scene setter. So, of course, you can't have effects unless you have contamination or exposure. And we've heard quite a bit already about this. Um, but again, just to reiterate that virtually uh, all environments that are, where people have looked, they've found microplastic pollution. Um, and when it comes to biota specifically, and the marine environment specifically, or aquatic environments, uh, every marine species they've looked at, from very small to very large, they found evidence of microplastic uh, um, ingestion. Different trophic levels, pelagic species, benthic species. But as we've also seen, we're starting to see it now. People are looking, find, finding it in drinking water, finding it in foodstuffs that humans eat as well. So I'm giving Amy a bit of a plug here. Um, I won't go into detail. I'm sure she'll be covering that. I'm going to start by introducing you to Brian. And you're going to be seeing a lot of Brian in the rest of my uh, presentation. And for the non-biologists amongst you, Brian is a fish. <laughs> Brian, he's a hungry guy, he likes his food. Normally, he would eat copepods. But this is where we, I want you to start to think a little bit about where organisms uh, ingest microplastics. So they can ingest it from their food. So if their food contains microplastic already, and then that organism ingests uh, a smaller organism, you get uh, ingestion of microplastic that way. But of course, Brian's quite a hungry fish. And Brian will go for anything that looks about the same size as his normal food. So they will also take directly items of plastic. So it really is a question of size. And this is very important when you think about microplastic. And I've tagged on at the end life stage. I'll come to that in a second. But here's Brian. He's grown up a bit now. and He's stopped eating copepods. And uh, he's a fully grown fish. And he eats other fish, smaller fish, that are not really wanting to be eaten. So ingestion is about prey size. So uh, it's very common for marine organisms to ingest plastic items, macroplastic, microplastic, that are relevant to their normal prey size. So plastic bottle here is a similar size to um, Brian's normal food. It becomes a viable target. I'm going to introduce you briefly to Brian's friend, Barbara. Barbara is a slightly different species. She's, uh, she might look the same, but she's a completely different species. Uh, and Barbara is a lot smaller. So Barbara, uh, full grown, will eat copepods. That's one of her main food sources. So she's not going to eat a plastic bottle, but she's going to eat plastic litter or plastic waste that is a comparable size to her food source. So in this case, we're starting to get to micron sized plastic particles, potentially. And then, of course, something that we often forget about this, we often go out and look for adult organisms, is life stage. This was Brian when he was a baby. Isn't he cute? <laughs> when he was a baby, he wasn't eating plastic bottles or big fish. He was eating small things, zooplankton. So again, exposure varies over life stage, varies over time. So the, the main focus uh, of this is about Toxicity. So I'm going to go on to toxicity a bit more now rather than ingestion. Um, as toxicologists or environmental scientists, one of the first places we look for uh, toxic effects or one of the levels we look for toxic effects is acute toxicity. Um, it's one of the more simple uh, endpoints to measure. You poke it with a stick, is it still alive or dead at the end of your experiment? When it comes to plastic, we're going to take large items first. So here's Brian again. He's mistakenly eaten his plastic bottle. And I think as Amy alluded to earlier, this is the same thing. It doesn't matter which species you're looking at, whether it's a whale, a seabird, a fish, microorganisms uh, like zooplankton, anything in between. It's all about the ratio of the ingested plastic to the size of the organism. So to our knowledge so far, there is no evidence of what we would call acute toxicity, where you have a classic response from organisms to uh, a pollutant. But in the case of these uh, plastic as a pollutant, you can get obstructional blockage. And as Amy suggested earlier, or uh, said earlier, this can do one of two things. 
Uh, it can prevent further uh, ingestion of food, so it partially blocks the stomach or fills the stomach so that the, uh, the organism can't ingest any further food. Or at least, as in the case of the whale, you get what's called diminished feeding stimulus, so pseudo-satiation, so that the animal feels full or quite all the time, so it doesn't have that uh, trigger to, for it to say that it's hungry to go and get more food. Um, it doesn't have to be a single item. It can be multiple items, and this is where things like fibres at smaller for smaller organisms or plastic bags for larger organisms that can get tangled up and effectively form a large mass inside the organism that then causes a blockage. So in theory, we can see that um, you know, it doesn't have to be one large uh, plastic item that causes a blockage. It can be multiple items that collect or accumulate over time in the stomach area of the gut. And of course, organism size, again, I'm going to stress this, is really important. Um, smaller organism, it doesn't have to be a big plastic bottle. It can be a piece of microplastic in theory. So. What we have seen is evidence for sublethal effects. So there's an increasing body of research work that has looked at a variety of different species, uh, from uh, uh, basic uh, planktonic species, zooplankton, quite a lot of benthic invertebrates, mussels, uh, sea urchins, oysters, worms that live in the sediment. And of course, uh, there's, uh, there's very few studies, sorry, on fish. Um, and this links into what Jan was saying, that it makes a lot of sense to look at these organisms that, uh, focus, that live near the benthos or in the benthos, because that's where we are seeing the highest concentrations of plastic. So the exposure is going to be higher for these types of organisms. But surprisingly, despite all the media attention, despite all of the reports that you'll see if you Google plastic or microplastic, there's all these claims about it being toxic. There's actually very limited number of studies that have picked this out as being a toxic pollutant. That said, the studies that I've just uh, highlighted, um, some of the endpoints that they have seen or toxicological effects that they have seen, and these we, we would consider sublethal effects. So this is not killing, but it's, it's an impact on the organism, an impact in a way that um, uh, reduces its ability to reproduce reduces its ability to develop normally, reduces its ability to eat properly. And, he's, uh, uh, and we're starting to see, particularly with smaller particles, that you can st you're starting to see things like inflammatory responses, phagocytic, uh, phagocytic activity. I'm just going to take a, a minute or two to talk about uh, the seafood industry in particular, um, because I think here in Norway it's a really important uh, industry. Um, and it's an industry that's under a lot of pressure from, from this topic. I've already told you that the impact or effects studies are really, really limited. When it comes to actual seafood species, most of the studies that have looked at uh, effects are limited to shellfish, mussels, oysters. Yes, we've seen a lot of studies that have looked at the ingestion of microplastic or the occurrence of microplastic in commercial uh, pelagic and demersal fish species. I've picked some uh, examples out here. But as far as we're aware, there isn't any obvious signs of toxicity beyond um, obstruction. Uh, and there's been very, very few studies that have looked at ingestion. And what's also people tend to forget, and this is quite important, is that most of these studies, they've collected the fish, they've opened the fish, they've taken the gut out, and that's where they look for the microplastic. So there's, there's very, very little evidence that there's microplastic in the flesh of the fish that you would eat. Different story for mussels and oysters where you eat the whole organism. I'm going to actually do, put a couple of slides in uh, on uh, a couple of nice studies. So one of the first studies that um, indicated that there was a potential for some sort of toxic effect after exposure to microplastic was one by Von Moose in 2012. So it's already five, six years old. Uh, that was with mussels. Um, and they showed, I can't remember, I should have put on here the size of the particles that they looked, but I'm, I remember that they were quite small. Um, but they found that the particles were present in the intestine of the organism, and that within a six-hour period after exposure to the particles, they started to observe histological changes um, and a strong inflammatory response. On this slide, I'm going to focus a little bit on oysters. Um, 
for those of you who are feeling wealthy, um, you can step up to oysters from mussels. Two studies uh, in, in recent years, well, there's been a number, but two that I picked out here. First one was by Cole and Galloway in 2015, where they were looking at uh, larvae uh, of oysters, and there were no measurable effects on the development or feeding capacity of the larvae. A second study in 2016 uh, by Susarelu um, with uh, adults, as far as I remember, um, uh, found that reproduction was affected by exposure to polystyrene microplastics, so there was decreasing egg production, sperm mobility, uh, and that impacted larval yield at the end. So these are good examples of where we're starting to see some sort of sublethal, that there's evidence for sublethal effects, but it's still very, very limited. I'm going to finish the presentation talking a little bit about nanoplastics, um, plastic additives, and adsorption of pollutant chemicals. I know I was told to talk about microplastic, but I think it's important to step a little bit into um, where the research field is headed right now. So we're back to Brian, um, and I've stripped him down a bit so you can see inside him again. Uh, and so here we've got a mixture of microplastic, which is the blue, and nanoplastic, which is the red. From what we understand, when an organism ingests microplastic, it goes into the gut. There's no evidence that this is uh, passing any biological membranes or barriers and actually accumulating, transferring and accumulating in the organism. What we're starting to see when you get down to the nano size, and we know this a lot from, uh, there's been a huge body of work in the last 10, 15 years on nanomaterials, nano safety, so fate and effects. We know that once you get down to the nanoscale, things start to change. They get particles that that size are small enough to begin to transverse uh, barriers, biological barriers. So there's at least potential for nanoplastics to transfer into the organism and undergo accumulation. What we know f uh, from uh, studies with, with other nanomaterials, so this is not nanoplastics but nanomaterials, is that Quite uh, in a similar way to a lot of pollutants, there's certain organs of uh, uh, an organism where accumulation uh, has been observed. I also want to point out that in fish, for example, once you get to the nanoscale, in addition to ingestion through uh, oral ingestion, you start to have um, potential uh, uptake through other routes as well, so the gills become viable transfer mechanisms or uptake, uptake routes. But the liver, kidney, brain amongst other organs, uh, have been shown to accumulate nanomaterials. And I'm going to highlight a study. This, uh, I'm going to uh, take a step outside of the marine environment for a minute and uh, just show you a recent uh, freshwater study that was uh, published last year by a Swedish group at Lund, um, where they were looking at nanoparticles or nanoplastic particles. Uh, they looked at transfer through a food chain, uh, which they observed. Uh, they also saw reduced survival of aquatic zooplankton, so that was the Daphnia. But I think the, the thing that caught most people's attention with this study was that the, it was a study, the study showed that there was uh, transfer. The, the, pass, uh, the nanoplastic particles were shown to penetrate the blood-brain brain barrier in, uh, in the fish species that they worked with. And that this led to behavioural disorders that impacted on feeding time, uh, distance during feeding time, distance travel during feeding time, uh, and one or two other uh, uh, endpoints. So this was a really nice study that started to show that at the nanoscale, plastic particles may well have uh, the potential to cause uh, quite important effects. Quick note on additive chemicals. I picked out bisphenol A because everyone's heard of that, but I mean, really, the number of additive chemicals that are used in plastics manufacture is just off the scale. And some plastics, things like PVC, it can be over 50% of the, the final plastic product is additive chemicals and fillers. So, and this is something we often overlook, actually, um, is, th is this part, these additive chemicals. Um, so I've used bisphenol A as an example. Um, the pink circle is a piece of plastic, a plastic, microplastic particle containing the, the chemical. And then, of course, when this is in a uh, natural environment or um, uh, any sort of environment where there's water, there's potential for this chemical to leak out. So if you have a lot of microplastic particles containing uh, particular additive chemicals, and 
Brian, we know how hungry he is, and never turns away the opportunity for a bit of food. You can have ingestion of these particles, and what we really, really want to start to look at now is we know that microplastics are going to be uh, excreted at the end, but there is a residence time, and particularly if you get them in larger organisms and they may become trapped for a period of time. And that is potentially sufficient time for you to, uh, for the particles to release some of these chemicals. And then you're getting direct release of a chemical inside of an organism. And once we're in back to chemicals, we're on more safe or familiar territory about uptake, transport, accumulation. So there's a huge number of chemicals and we have quite a bit of knowledge about the persistence of some of them, but a lot of them we have very limited knowledge about bioaccumulation and toxicity. And if you're having these chemicals released from plastic inside organisms, this is quite an interesting uh, thing that we want to follow up. Final thing I'm going to talk about is absorbed pollutants. This has been picked up quite a lot, actually, this, uh, this concept that microplastic, or any plastic for that matter, that is released into the marine environment when it comes into contact with um, what we'd call more conventional organic pollutants or metals, that the, the plastic um, being hydrophobic or, or, uh, or being organic in nature and a lot of these pollutants being quite hydrophobic, they have a natural affinity. So they're going to absorb to the surface. So it's a similar sort of concept in a way to the additives in the plastic, except that these are much more of a surface issue here rather than migration of a chemical from the interior of the plastic out. This is coating of the plastic... Uh, surface with um, chemicals and then it's pretty much the same process you know brian comes along ingests some of these plastic particles that have got uh, pollutants absorbed onto the surface and then we want to know if there is release of these chemicals and again accumulation or uptake accumulation potential for toxicity there's been a reasonable amount of work done on this over the last few years actually and it's still a bit of a gray area and there's a lot of unknowns and these different theories. There's been modeling studies that have said this is definitely not a problem. There's been experimental studies which have uh, appeared to show that there is definitely um, exposure and uptake of um, pollutants from plastic into organisms. Personally, I think one of the key issues is how you conduct these experiments. And a lot of these experiments have been done in this way. People have taken plastic, They've coated the plastic with very high levels of organic chemical. Then they've put it in water. Then they add their organisms. Then they conduct their toxicity study for X period of time. And then at the end, they, do their, uh, they measure their end point. The problem is, is that the moment you put these particles into water, whatever is absorbed on the surface immediately starts to try and establish an equilibrium and part of it will dissolve into the water. So actually a lot of these studies have effectively conducted at least partially a study of a standard toxicity test with the pollutant. So for me, it's my personal feeling is that I think a lot of the studies on this have not actually had good enough control over where their exposure of their exposure conditions. So I think we need to have much uh, we need to have improved experimental design before we can actually rule this in or out as a as a mechanism. So I'm going to stop there. I've talked for far too long. Um, I'm just going to summarise very quickly. So. Uh, microplastic ingestion has been demonstrated for a range of species. Um, Small number of studies have specifically reported impacts. Um, these are largely at the sublethal uh, level and evidence is pretty much weighted towards invertebrate species at the moment. Um, and these impacts appear to be linked or influenced specifically by particle size, where smaller sizes, particularly nanoparticles, uh, appear to be uh, more likely to elicit significant toxicological um, responses. Um, my personal feeling, I think that of the community in general, is that there's still insufficient data to draw strong conclusions regarding the impacts of microplastics on marine organisms. Um, and at, at least right now, whilst we're still trying to answer that question, there's always new questions coming up. And I think there's uh, a big need to explore uh, nanoplastic a little uh, more, particularly as we know that there's more likelihood that that can be acute, undergo true accumulation by marine organisms, any organism for that matter, uh, the role of additive chemicals as well. 
and something that I think Amy touched on a, a little bit, we really don't have much of an understanding of the effects of microplastic, nanoplastic uh, exposure and uptake at the population level uh, and the associated implications that this would have for food webs. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you enjoyed your wraps. Um,